through basaltic lavas. Last time we talked about the hoi hoi and then ah uh ah. -uh. And now I want to go into two more special types of basaltic lavas. So as we restart our notes here in this new lecture, we're actually going to be under C. And we're going to call this one special, special types or special textures really of basaltic lavas. And these special types are controlled by cooling rate. So let's say controlled by cooling rate. And we're going to talk about a really fast texture and a really slow. And we'll start with the slow one first. These are called columnar basalts. Better start with a picture here. These are spectacular. Wherever they have been found by mankind, we create these stories about them to try to explain how something so regular, so systematic, so, so it looks like it's built by a giant, giant's causeway in Ireland or by the devil with devil's post pile in California. How do we explain such regular texture through natural process? And I'd like to try to do that with you today. And we'll do this um, step by step. So in incidentally, um, this interval right here is what I mean by columnar basalt, where there's this very systematic, regular, regular jointing that produces these columns. And so what we'll start with, um, we'll start with the first bit we'll go is description. How, and we'll describe the texture, and then we'll get to how the process is that forms it. And so our description is, we're going to say that there are hexagonal to polygonal joints that produce regular columns that are many meters tall. That's the definition I want you to have for columnar basalt. If nature makes them perfectly, they'll be hexagonal, but sometimes they're actually polygonal. And when I say polygonal, I'm just talking like five to seven sides instead of the perfect six. So hexagonal to polygonal joints that produce a series of regular columns meters high. This is mostly how columnar basalts look. When I say joints, joints are a type of fracture. All right? There's no movement like on a fault. So if you just break rock but there's no movement, it's called a joint. So we're breaking rock. We're actually breaking the magma during cooling. And I guess I'm getting into the process a little bit now. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. We'll go the process. Well, ultimately, it's cooling controlled. And tensional cracks make these joints in response to slow, uniform cooling. Uh, yeah, we can go ahead and put that. So we're going to say tension cracks form, and our tensional cracks are our joints. If you want to like connect those two words together in your mind, that would be good. Tension cracks form in response to cooling, and importantly, it's slow, uniform cooling. These will not form if you don't have slow, uniform cooling. Now, why do tensional cracks form? Well, it's because the melt is contracting as it goes from liquid to solid. So one of the other processes we need to say here is that melt contracts. Melt contracts during cooling. And the cracks then that are forming in response to this contraction behave in a really specific way. And that's because nature wants things to minimize energy, right? All processes in nature act to minimize energy. And so that's why like a bubble is a sphere or why many things in nature form hexagons. And so if we were to look down on the surface here of the columnar basalt, here we're seeing the length of the columnar basalt, here we're looking at the top of the columnar basalt, we see these intersections between hexagonal columns that have an angle of 120 degrees. All right, so here is one of the joints, here's another joint, and there's another joint. And on average, that angle between the joints is about 120 degrees. And so what we're going to do is we need to like reproduce this in your notes and draw this sum in your notes. And what I want you to say is that melt contracts during cooling and 120 degree intersections Um, 
form because they are or they represent the lowest energy geometry. The lowest energy geometry. So what we could do in our notes is draw a picture. Here's like a point and melts contracting all around that point and cracks have to get produced in response to all the tension. And so a crack will form and another crack and another crack. And the angle between those cracks if we're doing it energetically favorably, the angle between them will be 120. And if we have another point here, well, then we should get a crack, a crack, and a crack. And another point here, a crack, a crack, and a crack. And you start to see how a hexagonal pattern starts to emerge from this cracking. Now, we don't only see this process in lavas. Actually, we, we have a, um, a sedimentary feature called mud cracks. So I want you to put here that this is an analogous process that we observe in mud cracks in sedimentary environment. So mud cracks in sedimentology is analogous. I think these are a beautiful feature that we see only in certain environments. We need to have environments where you have thick outpourings of basaltic lava that cool very slowly. And so these tend to be associated, and, and this will be in the next arrow. Where do we see columnar joints? Well, they tend, so we're going to say associated um, with, um, how do we say this, massive, maybe heavy, um, just high volume. We'll go with high volume basaltic volcanism. And this can be in a variety of different environments, but the most common environment is called a flood basalt province. And a flood basalt province, there's not that many of them on earth, these are places where a mantle plume impinges upon the crust and produces so much melt that erupts. And so we'll talk about those later in the semester, but we'll go flood basalt province as an introduction to you right now. And a flood basalt province is where a mantle plume, mantle plume impinges on crust. One other thing I do want to just kind of make like a little asterisk here is that there can be rhyolite columns. There can be andesite columns. It's not specific. Like um, most of the time we see them in basalt, but other compositions are possible. They're just less common and they tend to be less spectacular. Okay. So that's our process for columnar basalts. Oh, I forgot one other thing. Okay. So we're going to say uh, other comps possible, right? They're just rarer. And the other thing I guess I forgot to do is draw, we drew like the bird's eye view looking down. Why do the cracks form columns? Well, what ends up happening is here's our lava flow, yeah? And we have, this is the air surface and here's the ground surface. And where is it cooling first? Well, it's cooling near the top and it's cooling near the bottom. And so the tensional cracks start down here and they propagate perpendicular to the cooling surface. And they're also going to be forming here as well. And then as the lava flow slowly cools, these cracks that are forming will propagate deeper. Yeah, we can so we can draw these dashed lines going deeper. And you can and then of course they're coming from the bottom as well. And eventually they meet up, right? So we can kind of dr draw them connecting. And sometimes they actually meet up perfectly and you get these beautiful columns. Other times maybe they miss a little bit and you get some irregularity in the columns, but this is generally how they form. They're propagating up from the bottom and down from the top to produce columns, or even sometimes this is called a colonnade in um, side view. Now the other special type of texture forms in like the most opposite environment you can possibly have, and it's the fastest cooling environment for a basalt on earth, and that is underwater, where the water steals the heat as fast as it, you know, as anything possibly can. And so you rapidly quench the lava to form a texture. And this is how pillow basalts form. Now, underwater environment is the number one environment where magmas erupt, right? Along the mid-ocean ridge system. And so there are, uh, what do we say? 
just so many pillow basalts on Earth, just most of the time, they're underwater, but sometimes we see them at the Earth's surface because tectonics brings material that was once underwater to the Earth's surface. And the texture of this pillow basalt, while it's certainly very different than the beautiful colonnades we saw with columnar basalts, here we see a guy climbing over a series of pillows, and pillows might not be a great word, tubes or sacks could be another way we see this, but we see this kind of wormy pattern of basalt. And that's what these are. These are just kind of these interconnected in three dimensions, tubes, networks of basalt that's rapidly quenched. They're called pillows because if you see them in two dimensions, they kind of just look like these sacks. And let's put some of these notes in about pillows right now. We'll start it off with a description and then we'll get to process. So the description of a pillow basalt is like these sack-like bulbs because they're bulbous, but in three dimensions, so this is like in 2D, but in 3D are a interconnected network of stacked tubes. So are a network of stacked tubes. Now the process that's forming these tubes and why we get this form is because of rapid quenching with water. So our process here is eruption into water. It could be a river, it could be a lake, but the vast majority of times it is seafloor. So eruption into water which rapidly quenches the lava. And importantly, it quenches the outer rind of the lava to glass, which insulates the interior, allowing the interior lava to stay hot and keep moving, but creates this interesting um, form. So we're going to say eruption into water, which rapidly quenches an outer rind. Outer rind to, and rind just means margin, to glass. This glass actually insulates the interior, but it also will crack. And when it cracks, a new bulb can squirt out. So, and we'll just say, we'll say glass insulates, but also breaks. And so what I want you to picture is like, a, here we have a bulb, a sack of lava, and it's quenched to an outer rind and then that outer rind cracks because of pressure inside the bulb right and so then what ends up happening is a second bulb squirts out from the first and then it cracks and a second bulb squirts out and then it cracks and by doing this again and again we'll eventually create this 3d network this is how pillow basalts move and how lavas move on the ocean floor if we were to zoom in on um, an outcrop of a basalt, pillow basalt, we're going to look for certain textures. And one of the textures we're going to look for is a glassy rind. And so here we see, uh, uh, notice how this is a darker black and this is lighter. Well, that's because this is much more glassy than the interior. The other thing we're looking for is in between the different sacks, we're going to look for things that are evidence of um, ocean sediment. We need to put some of this in your notes now too. So let's make another drawing. Here's our ocean floor, and this is a 2D drawing of the ocean floor, and we have pillow basalts. So here's a pillow, it looks like a sack. Here's another pillow, and that's a 3D network of all these things stacked upon one another. They tend to show these kind of cuspate downward bits as the lava sacks down on top of uh, other earlier ones. So this might be what a pillow basalt sequence looks like in the rock record. And in between all the pillows, we should be looking for, can I use the word pelagic? I'm going to use it because building your vocabulary is my job. Pelagic means ocean. And so these are like uh, silicious oozes and planktons and, and things that you would find in an ocean. So pelagic sediments rest in the interstices or the areas between the different pillows. 
The other thing we're going to look for, we'll draw this in like this, we'll put, kind of put like a faint interior line, is that we should see a gradation in the texture. We should see glassy rinds that go to more crystalline interiors. And so what I'm trying to draw here is this glassy rind, indicating rind, how do we spell rind, R-I-N-D, indicating rapid quenching with ocean water. And those are our special types of basalts. We'll go into silicic lavas next.